let's talk about the Canon EOS R5 for wildlife photography. Hey guys, I hope you're all doing well. Ever since the Canon EOS R5 was rumoured, I've been watching the developments very closely to see what Canon would do. Although I currently use mostly Sony gear for my wildlife photography, I'm always very open to other systems. And in fact, I was quite interested in getting the EOS R5 if I thought it would fill a gap for me. Before the official announcement, I already did make a couple of videos in which I talked about what the EOS R5 might mean for wildlife shooters. Now, at the time of making this video, the camera has been officially announced and it's available for pre-order. So I'm making this video for a few reasons. One is for any wildlife photographers who might be wondering whether they should order this camera now. Another reason is to tell you what we've learned since the last time I talked about this camera and then also to tell you why I decided that the EOS R5 is not for me. Now, right up front, I'll say that I think the EOS R5 is a great option for current Canon shooters. If you are a Canon DSLR shooter, and especially if you have long EF lenses now, uh, and you want to get onto a mirrorless system, this is a great option. It's the best option right now. The problem is that there are no real reviews out there. And it, I'm not sure exactly what's going on, whether Canon is trying to control the story, but I've seen in various videos and discussions either people haven't really had a chance to really put the camera through its paces or they haven't been allowed to talk about certain things. But I think stuff is starting to slowly leak out. It's a pity also that if you go right now and try to find out more about the camera, mostly what you're going to find is a lot of discussion about the overheating problems with the video and Canon made such a big deal about the video capabilities and about the AK video and really hyped it up. And the thing is that the, the fact that it overheats is really no surprise. There's certainly no surprise for Sony shooters because we've been through many iterations of Sony cameras that had overheating issues with 4K video. And since the EOS R5 has no specific passive or active cooling system, it's not surprising that there are limits to the recording times with AK. Now, what's unfortunate is that when the camera does overheat, it takes a uh, very long time to recover and it doesn't really seem to dissipate the heat uh, very well. So, for example, according to the, 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 the guidance that Canon has put out now, and they've been trying to address this issue because it sort of has blown up in the last few days. They've, they've, they've put out some guidance and talking about why they didn't put a, a fan in the camera and so forth. So what they're saying is that if you're shooting in, say, 23 degrees Celsius or 70, 73 degrees Fahrenheit, you can shoot 8K30P for 20 minutes. Now, if you then, once it overheats, if you then let the camera cool down for 10 minutes, you can shoot for another 3 minutes. And if you let it cool down for 20 minutes, you can shoot for another 8 minutes. So the recovery times are not really great, or the, the ability of the, the camera to, to cool down and recover so that you can keep shooting is not, not great. The other thing is that you can only shoot the 8K video to the CF Express card, so you can't write simultaneously to the SD card, which means that if something happens to the CF Express card, you could possibly lose work. Now, the thing is that what's even worse with the the video is that even the oversampled 4K 30p that's that's sampled down from 8 or 8.2K is limited to 30 minutes. Now, you can shoot 4K 30p with no time limit if you shoot without the oversampling if you if you sort of have line skipping um, from the sensor which is which is not not so great so as i said everyone is talking about the overheating right now it's a, it's a pity but in a way canon sort of brought this on themselves by making such a big deal about uh, the video now of course for wildlife photography we're not really so interested in the video we're much more interested in the stills now in the past when i talked about this camera i raised the issue of the uh, availability of long lenses, uh, long RF lenses. And the last video I made, I talked about what were at the time rumored F11 lenses. So th there were rumored 600 and 800 millimeter F11 lenses. And it turns out these lenses are real. So they were announced uh, at the time that the camera was announced. 
what we didn't know then and what we know now is that these camera these lenses have a telescoping design so these are prime lenses that collapse down to a smaller size so that's pretty cool so they collapse down so that they're shorter for for traveling now one of the things we were worried about with f11 apart from the obvious issues with f11 was how the autofocus performance would be and it turns out that it is compromised so apparently the focus area of the coverage of the sensor is greatly reduced so you're not getting full coverage of the sensor you're only getting a small area in the center i haven't been able to find out exactly how big that area is but apparently it's about what you would get with a typical dslr now one of the things that was exciting when we found out about it was that Canon have what they call advanced animal autofocus. So I've seen some videos demonstrating this and it looks pretty good. It looks about on par with what we see with Sony. And as Canon had said, they're not only identifying the head and the eyes of certain subjects, but they're also detecting the body as well. And I did see that in, in some of the videos. What I also did see, however, was that it was a little bit laggy in some cases with the eye tracking, but I think it can only get better through firmware updates and it, they, clearly, they clearly have enough processing power in the, in the camera. So I, th I think it looks very promising. So overall, I, I think it looks like a very capable camera for, for wildlife photography. But here's the thing, especially if you're trying to compare it to Sony's lineup, cameras like the A7R4 and the A92, both are cameras that I, I shoot with. The thing is that I think the camera that it is really sort of trying to compete with mostly is the A7R4, but the resolution of the EOS R5 is 45 megapixels. It's not the 60 megapixels of the A7R4. So it's not the resolution monster that the, the A7R4 is. In fact, the A7R3 has 42 megapixels. So it's really, in terms of resolution, competing with a camera that is a previous generation Sony camera. Another thing that is interesting to note is that they have a anti-aliasing filter on this camera. And this is something that uh, is sometimes controversial because I think the trend has been on a lot of cameras, certainly a lot of high resolution cameras uh, to not have the AA sensor on there, uh, the AA filter on there, sorry, I should say. Uh, and you may remember with Canon's uh, 5DS and 5DSR, they had two versions of the camera, one with the AA filter and one without it. Now, the AA filter that is in the EOS R5 is the one that, same as the one that's in the 1DX Mark III. It's this new, what they call high-res Gaussian distribution low-pass filter that is supposed to perform better than a classic or a regular AA filter. And I've, I've researched this a fair bit, and I think, from what I've read, it, the jury is still out on, on how much better it actually is. But the thing is that, uh, so when you look at the resolution, it's not really as good as the A7R4, but the thing is that that may be a good thing or it may be a bad thing. I love the A7R4, I have, I have two of them, uh, and for the things that I do, it's, uh, I, I, it, it, it's a great performer for me, but I'm also using it with some of the best prime lenses in Sony's lineup, and I've always said that I think that that camera is best suited to those kinds of lenses. So there is a price to pay when you're using a such a high resolution sensor like that. So for many people, 45 megapixels actually may be perfect. It may be the sweet spot because they just simply may find 60 megapixels too high because of the, the noise at higher ISOs or because of the large file sizes and, and how it affects the buffer when you're, when you're shooting a lot of action, especially. Now here's the other thing. Canon are saying that the EOS R5 can shoot 10 frames Per second with the mechanical shutter and 20 frames per second with the electronic shutter. So when you compare that to the A7R4 which can shoot 10 frames per second with mechanical and with electronic, it seems that the EOS R5 is better. It's, it's more capable in terms of burst rates. 
But the thing is that I think this 20 frames per second, it's a little bit like the 8K. It's not really entirely true, or at least it's crippled in some way. Because now we don't actually know yet because we haven't seen the data. Uh, we haven't seen the testing on this, but these, even though the EOS R5 is capable of pushing a lot of data through, it has a very high data throughput, uh, clearly because it can shoot that 8K video, the sensor readout speed is unlikely to be anywhere near as fast as the A9 or the A92. The, the A9 and the A92 have a fast sensor readout speed that enables the camera to uh, focus and expose 60 times per second, to do those calculations 60 times per second. Uh, it also means that you can shoot 20 frames per second on those cameras with no distortion in the images. So the thing is that if the EOS R5 can't do that, if, if there's if there will be distortion in those images when you're using the electronic shutter at 20 frames per second, to me, it's actually pretty useless, right? Like, you're not going to shoot 20 frames per second with a static subject. You're going to shoot 20 frames per second with a fast-moving subject. And if those images are distorted, it's really not that interesting. So to me, it's, it's crippled in a way, very much like the AK video. Yes, it's capable of doing it, but what are the real world situations in which you would actually use it? So the bottom line is, to me, when you when you think about this camera, uh, firstly, I think it is a exciting camera, especially for Canon, current Canon shooters who want to stay with with Canon. But I don't really think it's pushing the envelope, right? So the thing is, I think it's a great uh, all rounder. It's a sort of jack of all trades, but it doesn't really push the envelope. And that doesn't mean it's a bad camera. For some people, it may be the perfect camera, especially for people who want a single body. But for me, I would personally much rather stick with what I have, which is where I have two cameras, actually three, because I have two A7R4s and, and an A92, that are the best at what they do, rather than trying to do multiple things and only sort of being mediocre at, at any of those those things. With the a7R4, I have a camera that is the highest resolution full-frame camera on the market. And especially when you when you pair it with big aperture prime lenses, you can get amazing image quality and detail. The A92 is fantastic for capturing fast action or sustained action, and it can do it silently. And Sony's Animal IAF is great. Uh, so, and I'm not even going to say that the A9 or the A92 is, is the best camera for general action now because I think the 1DX Mark III actually eclipses it in many ways. Uh, but you can shoot in complete silence with the A9 and the A92 and they have Animal Eye autofocus, which the, the 1DX Mark III doesn't have. Now, of course, for me, multiple bodies work because I shoot primes and I need to have different focal lengths and I want to be able to switch between those focal lengths quickly and not have to change lenses on the cameras. Uh, and I like to have backup bodies when I'm in the field. Uh, but for people that, that only want to have one body, uh, or perhaps they want to have a mirrorless body alongside a DSLR, especially as they're making the transition, I think the EOS R5 could be a great choice. For me personally, I'm looking forward to something like the EOS R1 or whatever it will be called, which really hits it out of the park and would be sort of more like a fully mirrorless uh, 1DX Mark III. So those are my thoughts on the EOS R5. I do think it looks like a very capable camera, uh, but as I said, I don't really think it's, it's pushing the envelope. If you guys want to chat about this, uh, as always, uh, I invite you to comment below or if you want to have a extended discussion, hop on over to the Discord server and we can talk further about it. Thanks for watching. I'll see you guys in the next video.